And now very graciously joining us on a very early Saturday morning. Uh, thank you so much, Kat Silverman, for hopping on the show. For those who are not familiar with Kat's work, she's the goaltending scout for Elite Prospects. She does scouting reports and player grades there for targets across the hockey world. She's actually a goaltender herself, coach, journalist, runner, has bylines at The Athletic, In Goal Magazine, NHL.com. There's more coming, apparently. Um, just a very decorated person overall and a fan of New York style pizza, which I think we can all sign off on. So Kat, thanks so much for join joining us here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's a, uh, it's not that early anymore. Uh, for the <laughs> record, it's, it's officially, it's about to be 10 AM here. I don't think I can call that, call that early anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to give you every, every out here, um, you know, in, in case anything goes awry, that we can say, oh, well, you know, it was just early. It happens. That's, that's uh, the go-to excuse. That's always early the go-to excuse. Yeah, we're, we're all about providing ourselves excuses here. Um, but anyway, so today, because Kat is such an expert on goaltending, on this show, we talk so much about John Gibson and other Ducks prospects. But if we're being honest, mainly John Gibson, um, unless maybe Ryan Miller comes back, who knows? So we figured we might as well get someone in here who actually knows what the heck they're talking about with goalies. So we're just going to run through some questions with Kat. You know, we're probably going to, you know, maybe throw in a maybe a little few other questions here and there just to kind of see if anything else pops up. But this should be pretty interesting. So let's just dive right into it. So one thing I just kind of wanted to start off here, Kat, just broadly you know, I think that when you hear people talk about goalies, there's a lot of talk about, hey, you know, the, the position has really evolved in the last 20 years, right? You had goalies go to butterfly style, Patrick Waugh, and then all of a sudden, you know, that's that's kind of it. That seems where the, to be where the conversation ends, at least within mainstream hockey media. But, you know, when you watch goalies today, you know, it feels like even within the last five to 10 years, there's been kind of another mini revolution. Would you agree with that at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was there was obviously, like you said, that main evolution where we moved from a uh, from from what we see in those old school videos, where uh, bless their hearts, but uh, you know those those goalies <laughs> couldn't stop they they'd stop like half of the shots nowadays playing the way they they used to. Um, to really really having a such a technically strong position, it's probably one of the most technically nuanced positions in hockey, and that's. That's not necessarily bias. I think it's just uh, it's tricky and it's it's a game of percentages of little tiny minute movements and calculations and and we did see that massive shift and then over the last like you said five or ten years we saw another little shift where we saw these guys sort of move from from it being this really remote or really robotic uh, sort of jerky almost a, almost a stiff robotic set of movements to a uh, to really bringing some creativity back into it bringing in some influences from around the world that's been to me the biggest uh sort of catalyst in the second movement is we're seeing goaltending coaches that can they can work together through zoom they can work together through getting together and youtube clips and instagram and all of that and so we're seeing all these influences coming together and and goalies are getting more creative because they now have three or four different options for for every save selection that they could potentially make. And uh, so we're seeing we're seeing sort of a shift back in the direction of maybe a little bit more creativity, a little bit more fun. Um, can make some some fans nervous. Can make some goalie coaches nervous too. Watching some of the things that goalies are doing now, but we're seeing them play play the puck more. We're seeing them skate more. Uh, they're not just playing this this drop down butterfly style as much as they did during that first evolution there. So, so what do you think? Uh, kind of the biggest reason for that kind of changes. I know you mentioned goaltending coaches, and one of the things that pops into mind, kind of with the Ducks specifically, is kind of looking back at the Ducks had Francois Lair for so many years as their goaltending uh, consultant and basically taught J.S. Shiger to play his way. And kind of you mentioned he was kind of that that more so get into the blocking position, be a bit more robotic, not as much kind of free flowing as we see with John Gibson nowadays. Do you think it's that's it? The goaltending coach, I know you mentioned that, but there's new new blood coming in that came from a different era that are taking kind of that that mold that Francois Allaire kind of taught and kind of now adjusting that to allow the more freedom guys to use their athleticism basically. 
I think that's that's definitely part of it. You know, we saw you you'll still see a few scouting reports here and there where they call a goaltender um, a butterfly goaltender, which I think is super cute because they're all butterfly goaltenders <laughs> now. There yeah. there are no non butterfly to stand up. Yeah, right. <laughs> there are no stand up guys left except for like maybe Alex Stalock. Um, <laughs> but you you know we're seeing that shift where all the goalies were playing the same way and and there had to be this upper hand somewhere you know otherwise some guys just weren't going to be able to thrive um and so i think that that's part of the reason that we saw that shift you know everybody started playing the same butterfly style and that doesn't that drop down super robotic thing it doesn't play to like you said the athleticism for some people um, John Gibson's one of them. You see guys like Thatcher Demko, uh, Andre Vasilevsky, um, even coming in in the next couple of years here, guys like Yaroslav Askarov, um, playing just that super robotic style wasn't doesn't really help them much. It doesn't play to their advantages. And so seeing these coaches sort of collaborate together to uh, to sort of, um, sorry, my daughter just got mad that uh, Sean the Sheep was coming on and instead of the other show she was watching. <laughs> but uh, no, sort of seeing that that collaboration to help work with the natural strengths of these guys, the athleticism for some, and not so much athleticism as agility, seeing the guys who are more flexible, the ones who have more fluid movement, the ones who have more accurate hands versus a uh, more powerful leg movement, more explosive lateral movement, stuff like that, where we're seeing the coaches start to incorporate that stuff just a little bit more. So, Okay. Well, this is kind of a kind of a bit of an off the wall question, but what's the biggest equipment related change you've seen? in the last few years? So this is just a nerd question, but I am curious about this. What was that again? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. What's the biggest equipment related change that you've seen in the last few years? If That's at all. That's so tough. That's no, <laughs> there's, uh, it's actually, I was, I was joking about this at, at my non-hockey related job a couple of days ago um, when we were talking about the weight change. Um, Cause I work, I coach both with hockey and running and uh, just the weight change technology in gear between both sports running shoes are now like a 16th of the weight that they used to be. And hockey equipment is too. So goalie pads, I still have my old Simmons ultralights. Um, oh wow. And they, I weighed them on my, like my regular scale just for funsies. I think it was at the end of last year when I was moving <laughs> to a new place. Um, I put them on the scale before I packed them up and uh each one of those pads weighed like 9.6 pounds. And you that, look at the weight like of the pads. <laughs> yeah, it's, they're, they're like bricks. And then you see the pads now, especially like the Bauer lines. Uh, Vaughn still to me is a little on the heavier side. CCM's a little heavier than, than Bauer. Brian certainly is. But the Bauer ones in particular, I think they're like under four pounds a piece. And so oh, both wow. pads combined is the weight of one of the pads that I have from probably only like 2004 or 2005. And so looking at that weight change, I mean, the other technology, the, the material that they use has changed a little bit. Uh, some of the stitching to make it more or less durable. Um, but the weight overall is, it's like night and day, putting on old equipment versus new. And and that's kind of the same with skates too. Um, but that's, I think the skates are another conversation unto oh, themselves. Yeah. That, that they, was they took that. That, that is that what, what, is that what you were thinking? I, I, wanted, I wanted to jump in on that real quick because I remember a couple years ago, it was, what was it, VH came out with their one-piece mm -hmm. skate, and I believe Ryan Miller was one of the first ones, and the biggest thing with him was he, mm -hmm. I remember him saying he had different length legs, and so he used to have a spacer in one of his skates. I randomly remember huh. reading this somewhere, <laughs> and wow. because of VH being able to make it as a one-piece, they made the holder a little bit taller for him. And so it was the first skate ever that he never had to have a spacer in. And he's like, the difference in that skate for that and was insane for him. So I was going to ask you about that with that one piece skate. How much of a difference does that actually make in terms of, I know on the surface level, it doesn't seem like it makes any difference, but for these guys at the absolute elite level, it seems like it might make some difference with that little bit of energy transfer coming a little bit quicker. Even for even for lower level goalies, like I, I was a big um I was a big graph fan. Um okay. that was that was my skate of choice and, and those are kinda like bricks too. I, I, I liked heavy equipment. Um <laughs> I don't know why. And uh the 
the guy who runs the pro shops here in Phoenix, um, I told him that after I had my daughter, my feet grew. Um, so none of my skates fit me anymore. Um, and so I told him, I was like, I need new skates. Uh, you only have one graph and it's a children's size. Like, can you bring some in for me? And he said, no. He was like, those things are 8,000 pounds. Technology has changed. Welcome to the 21st century. Let's put you in new skates. And he put me in the the, the new Bauer skates. Um, okay. And they're the ones that no longer have the cowling on them. And it was like night and day. Once huh. again, just the weight difference. Um, and so that does make a difference when it comes to skating. Because um, not having that extra weight for lifting your leg over the course of a practice or a game or a back-to-back, um, that's that's huge. Um, but also taking away that cowling, just that little bit of extra plastic on the outside, the reinforcement is on the inside now instead. And so when you drop into Butterfly and you're then going to put your skate blade back down to push back off, uh, you actually have a little bit of a lower angle to get to, to get up to the mm-hmm. skate because you're not being propped up on the angle from that uh, from that cowling. And so it actually does make a little bit of a difference with with your angles as well and the way that you're playing and where you feel for the ice because you have that, you really have to have that instinctual knowledge of how far you need to move your leg to push off at the speed that, that you want to. And uh, I was talking with uh, Arizona Coyotes goalie, Auntie Ranta, about that. Um it was either his first year in Arizona or his last year in New York. We were talking about it and he had actually tried them out during the season, put them back in his closet and then took them out again over the summer to work <laughs> with because he thought it felt great. It was super light, but it was just, it was such a difference when it came to those little, little millimeter degrees um, for change and for angles and for just his overall spatial awareness huh. that he, he wanted the chance to really get used to that during an off season rather than during games themselves. And that, that was surprising because he got them before I did. Um, oh, <laughs> obviously, wow. you know, the, the pros got them first and, uh, and then I tried them and, and he was right. It's, it's definitely something that does take a little bit of getting used to. And then once you, once you get used to it, it's, it's a dream. You're no longer carrying weights <laughs> on your feet, but, uh, <laughs> and they, they fit better too. They're a little bit more contoured. Um, but yeah, it definitely does make just a little, little bit more of a difference than I thought it would for sure. That yeah, that's really really interesting. And interesting. Yeah, I, I really want to look at those skates a little bit at one point in time. But so, goaltenders have often been categorized as either kind of technical or they're athletic. It feels like they they try to lump them in one of those two categories. Do you think that still actually exists, or we kind of have this blend nowadays and mainstream media just really are, are stuck in their ways and don't want to change their their views at all? It's uh I think it's more that they use the wrong the wrong term there. Because okay. every time they say that they're like, oh, this is an athletic goalie, this is a technical goalie. I'm like, what what about the technical goalie do you think is not athletic? Like like Corey Crawford, not a guy who makes some of those crazy Jonathan Quick-esque saves, um, yeah. but certainly an athlete, certainly athletic. Um, it's more, I would say, agility versus technical, because um, there are guys who, you know, they play with a narrower stance. They drop into butterfly more than they do make some of those diving saves, the split saves. They they don't stand quite as wide because both for energy conservation and some of them, their hips can't take it. Some of them aren't flexible enough for it. Um, and so there is a difference there. You see, obviously a, a guy like Crawford and a guy like quick don't, don't look like each other when they're playing even a little bit. Um, but, but using the term athletic, I think is where the media sort of, sort of misses the mark on that because every goalie is athletic. If you're not athletic, you're in trouble. You're not going to make it. Um, yeah. And so when they use that, it's sort of it almost does a disservice to the guys like a uh, like John Gibson, Jonathan Quick, Marc Andre Fleury. These guys who really play just a super creative game that involves just a little bit, just maybe a higher incidence of split saves. I guess is the best way to put it. Um, <laughs> it does them a disservice to just say, "Oh, athletic," because there's there's a difference between being athletic and being flexible, and and I think that's where they're sort of miscategorizing them a little bit yeah we should just start we should just flip that and call them either unathletic or untechnical and, and <laughs> see how that goes um well 
So you, you brought up John Gibson, and we should probably get to that at some point. So he is definitely an athletic goalie. I think that we can agree with that. I mean, is there, you know, so how would you just describe like his game overall? Is there maybe an element of it that just the average fan, the average commentator, you know, might not catch? What what are we all kind of missing or what are you seeing in his game just overall? Um, I think he's he's very economical with his movement. Um I I was on a podcast earlier in the summer and I might have implied that he looks like he's baked all the time. That, that, sounds, just, that, so, that sounds accurate, honestly. He's so, and, oh, and I was no. as soon as I said it, I like I, I I wound it back really fast and was like, please, <laughs> on the record, I don't think John Gibson smokes weed. <laughs> I was like, let me let me go on record as saying that. But no, he just he doesn't move unless he needs to. And he does play with that wider stance at times and he does make those split saves because he can but he he doesn't move quite as much as like you compare him to a guy like like Jonathan Quick who's some like just right up the road in LA who if he's not moving side to side at all times I think he he might just combust (laughs) and so he's moving constantly and then you see John Gibson who if he doesn't need to move he doesn't (laughs) And so that almost makes it look sometimes when he does allow a goal, like he's being lazy, but I think he's just, he's very conservative with his movement. And that's part of why I think he's continued to thrive over what is it now? Three seasons, almost four of a uh, being battered with 30 shots a night, 40 shots a night, yeah. something, yeah. something yeah. in there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and that, that's part of why, towards the end of the game, you don't really see him slipping. You see some of those guys who really move all over the place if they have to play a back-to-back. I think Mike Smith is a great example. Um, a guy who moves maybe maybe a little more than he needs to um, and does all right with the adrenaline for the first game. And then if he plays a back-to-back, he tanks it. That second game, he's done. And you don't really see that from a guy like John Gibson. So that's, to me, the biggest the biggest thing that stands out in his game is that he could he could play a back-to-back. I don't think it's being nice to him, but he could and he'd do just fine. Yeah, just just to quickly follow up on that with Gibson, he does remind me of that goalie when you're growing up who's just really good and is playing at a lower level and just doesn't really (laughs) need to try that hard like in warm up. (laughs) And he's just standing there (laughs) pretending to get in his stance. Um, But his personality is also very much like that. He's just a very Laid laid back, doesn't really say a whole lot, at least to the media. So it is funny that that's kind of where your mind went initially because that's it just yeah, seems that's, to be kind of who he is. Yeah. So and it works for him apparently. So. Yep. And yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny because that is a complaint that some people have about him. So it's entertaining that you kind of keyed in on that. But that is honestly, like you said, kind of his trademark and one of the things that makes him so great is his ability to kind of be a little bit more relaxed, not take everything so seriously, and kind of be more economical with his movement. So. Part of the reason, though, last year, though, now that we're on Gibson, that they went, uh, that they were so bad last year, is that he went from being a uh, top three goalie in the league to, I mean, per GSAX, he was below average last year. Do you kind of have any feel for kind of what made this change happen? What was was there a difference in his game? Was it uh, one of the things we've speculated on is just after all of the years of facing thirty plus shots, it finally got to him last year and. Uh, it was more so an exhaustion type of thing. Is there anything that you kind of saw in his game that kind of led led to that type of performance? What was the difference there? That would that would honestly be my best guess. Um, we see it from from every good goalie who faces huge workloads. Uh, we see it, we saw it from Braden Holtby, Fred Frederick Anderson. That's a he is no longer in Anaheim, but he's unfortunately facing the same situation where he's being vastly overworked up in Toronto. And then they're surprised when over the back half of the season, he no longer looks like like a Vesna candidate, you know, back half of the season into the playoffs. He looks tired and he looks kind of sloppy and his game just isn't where it used to be. And uh, I didn't watch as much John Gibson as I used to. Um, I used to watch most of the games that that were on it at a time that I could just because he was so much fun to watch mm-hmm. and it reached a point last year as delicately as possible. We're watching California NHL hockey yeah. <laughs> with self harm. <laughs> it yep, wasn't fun watching say. any of those three teams. And so I didn't, yep. 
I didn't watch nearly as much as I used to. Um, but just just the exhaustion. He looked a little sloppy on certain things. His timing was just a little bit off, and that's even though he's good with his movement. I think there's there's a level of mental fatigue that comes from playing as many games as he does and playing again against as many shots as he does and playing behind uh, the lack of structure that he did. You know, having having such inconsistency and not not necessarily to the detriment of the players. You know, that's not to insult the players that are on the ducks right now. They, there's been a lot of turmoil, a lot <laughs> of, uh, a lot of departures, a lot of young kids coming in. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's hard to, when you're the goaltender behind a very young team, look at back East, what happened with Henrik Lundqvist. He, he had quite a few new additions to the team who weren't super experienced. The old ones were, uh, were, we're a little older. Um, we saw the same thing in Chicago. And eventually that's that's just hard to keep up with mentally as a goaltender as well, even if you play in a way that really keeps you as as physically ready as you can be for for that style of play. Eventually it just it's hard to read it. And I think that's we'll we'll see. Obviously, we didn't get a chance to see during the play in round, like with uh with Carrie Price and Corey Crawford, they were guys who, after getting some extra rest, they came back for the playoffs and looked amazing. Um, we unfortunately didn't get to see that from John Gibson because the Ducks did not make it. Um, but we got, you know, an extra rest after that too. He'll, it'll be, it'll have been what nine months at this point, maybe oh, ten yeah. by the time he uh, he gets a chance to play another NHL game, and it's not rest through injury recovery he's getting rest through legitimate rest and i think we'll we'll probably see him bounce back because of that yeah there's going to be so many guys i think around the league who are going to benefit so much from that time mm -hmm. off because this is just so unprecedented but um you know we jake did bring up the the statistical element of this with gsax and that is a predominant component for our analysis when we talk about goalies here on the show with those stats like evolving hockey's goal saved or expected. So for you just personally, when you're scouting or, you know, are there numbers that you prefer to look at when you're evaluating a goalie, you know, either pro or amateur and just in general, how do you think goalie analytics or statistics could be improved or what's working there? What's not kind of what's your, what's your overall view there when it comes to goalie stats? Um, honestly, I, I think that they can be improved uh, in every area because it's easy to come up from ground level. Goalie stats are, they're, they're yeah. terrible. Um, and part of it's because with no disrespect to evolving hockey and to some of the other publicly available data companies uh, and trackers, the publicly accessible data on goaltenders is not super accurate. And uh I've, I've been lucky enough to work with Elite Prospect and Ingle Magazine where we have access to some of the more privatized data. Um, we have data from some of the companies that work. Um, we have data from some of the teams. And the numbers are, in some cases, they're kind of close. In some, they're, they're super far off. And so, <laughs> wow. and so I don't use a lot of the numbers unless I'm allowed to reference one's that are being used by by the private companies just because the numbers aren't super accurate. And so what we're hearing about one goaltender using Evolving Hockey's numbers versus Natural Stat Tricks numbers versus uh, ClearSight Analytics, uh, one goalie can have three completely different results from all three. And that's that's not necessarily a criticism of them. That's, that's more a criticism of the NHL because um, the tracking data that they're offering is pretty flawed. Um, so, so yeah, everything can be improved there. Um, it's hard to say which number I'd use just because it's all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But, Fair enough, yeah. <laughs> but looking at it, not from a, I try not to do it from a comparison standpoint, but at least from an individual standpoint. So looking at John Gibson's numbers over the course of a full season, against himself because if the data is being tracked inaccurately in Anaheim versus Chicago or Anaheim versus Minnesota um, through the NHL, at the very least, you're getting fairly consistent data for one goalie on his own team. And so you can at least look at how his numbers are ebbing and flowing and compared to prior seasons, which mm. so looking at his expected, expected safe percentage and stuff like that, you can, you can kind of compare himself to himself 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, but comparing it to the other goaltenders, uh, I found to be pretty tricky. And that's huh. that's been, to me, one of the hardest parts about doing any sort of goaltending analysis is when you go to use the numbers, your hands are a little tied still. So. I love that even in the NHL, it's just like in beer league, you can't rely on the shots being you accurate <laughs> when you're looking at stats. <laughs> like, you how can't. is this still an issue when you get to the to well, the highest it's, level? It's amazing. We'll sit there at, at Coyotes games, and I've I've sat there at some games in in other arenas too. So it's not just the guys at mm-hmm. at Gila River. Um, not to not to call them out. Um, but we'll sit there, and the shots that are showing up on the scoreboard. <laughs> are completely different from the numbers that people are seeing on the TV screen. And then they're different from the ones that are listed on the NHL website. And it'll That's take good. like 20 minutes for it to finally like come together <laughs> and have like a universally, uh, like I think it was this past season. It was either this past season or the one prior we were sitting there and we watched as the scoreboard started taking shots away in real time during a period against one of it was either against the coyotes goalie or against the opponent and we just kept watching the shot count get lower and lower and we're like what is <laughs> what is happening <laughs> it just kept oh. going down and finally it went down i think a total of like four or five shots in the first five minutes of the game and oh. that to me is just it's that's it so makes good. it very hard to to accurately compare goaltenders especially when we're using the live tracking data like when we're looking at I'll use it like the game flow charts from natural stat trick and stuff like that. They're, yeah. they're awesome tools, but they're, they're still not super mm-hmm. accurate and that's okay. not their fault. That's the NHL's fault. <laughs> so okay. yeah, sounds, that's fair. So, sounds about right. So kind of, I want to piggyback off, off this question though, speaking of analysis, um, what's your biggest pet peeve when it comes to like national broadcasters in the way, or even local broadcasters? I mean, the ducks, they have Brian Hayward, who's a former NHL goalie as their uh as their color commentator what's your biggest pet peeve in terms of what you hear them talk about in terms of analyzing goaltending and kind of what needs to be done on the national level local level to kind of better the analysis that we all hear on tv because i mean as a ducks fan what i've always my biggest issue is that that's the person that the majority of the fans use to inform themselves. And so the only way that you can get be- uh, a better fan base, more educated fan base is with better analysis on television. And so what do you think kind of needs to be done on that aspect? Or what do you think needs to be improved? Um, It's, it's hard because from, from color commentator to color commentator, there's, there's a lot of variance true, there. True. Um, I think that the golden standard, honestly, I, uh, not to make Ducks fans mad, but is the Kings. The Kings color commentators do a really good job. <laughs> and that covering the Coyotes was very hard to admit. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But looking at what, what we get from the color commentary in Anaheim, which is, it's full of a lot of generalization sometimes. Yep, and yep. and the, the hockey talk. And then in Arizona, we have Tyson Nash. He's he's good for, for a few jokes. Um, and then a lot of, outdated terms like ladies tea um Ugh, but yeah, yeah. Was gonna other, than, that, yep. other yeah. than that we don't get a lot of in-depth analysis and then with the king's broadcast i mean they'll bring out their marker they're like the weatherman oh yeah and they'll, they'll start drawing plays on the screen during breaks in play during intermission they'll talk about systems and and part of that to me is the king's broadcast team talks to the coaches all the time and they talk about okay what is this systems play what do i call it how do i explain it um you see it i think it's huh. philadelphia um because they get um they get brian boucher a lot okay as one of their one of their commentators and um he does the same thing he'll talk about some of that breakdown of systems and plays and and save selections and that that takes homework you know you have to even if you played the position in, in Tyson's case, you know, five or 10 years ago, in Hayward's case, a while ago. <laughs> 20, 30, yeah, 30. something like that. Maybe you know, 30. Even if you, even if you played at some point, you, you have to sort of humble yourself and talk to the coaches about what they're teaching right now, what the goaltender is working on. So you can say, this is the style they're playing. This is where they made mm-hmm. a mistake. This is what they should be doing. Um, 
and just just learning. You have to sort of soak it up. Um, I think we could stand to see a lot more of that um, when it comes to the broadcast teams. Um, I, that's to me. That's probably it. My biggest pet peeve is a uh, when they talk about huge saves. <laughs> so tired of hearing about the huge <laughs> saves. So tired of hearing about them because usually the huge save is a uh, is the one that shouldn't have happened in the first place. <laughs> right. You know, sure. you'll have a save that was jo- just so a, Jonathan Quick. a sloppy mistake. <laughs> yes, yes. The Jonathan <laughs> Quick saves are uh, when they talk about him having the save of the year. I'm like, oh, that's yeah. I'm I'm happy for him. That's like dropping your baby and then managing to catch it before it <laughs> falls on its head. Like I guess that's a save of the year. That's, well, a, great, um, <laughs> that's a great analogy right there. But, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a brutal one, but yeah, it, I mean, it's perfect though. <laughs> Does the job. <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, that's kind of what what drives me a little crazy because that is, like you said, that's what um, that's what a lot of fans get their analysis from, and so they'll you'll see a, a more a more quiet goaltender. Um, sort of get get ignored by the broadcast a little bit because they're not doing anything overly crazy they're just sort of they're just sort of there they're making their routine saves and then like Darcy Kemper makes some kind of hairy saves sometimes and we'll hear oh that was that was a must save beautiful play by him save the game for the team and and then you sort of follow that narrative and it it just that's that's my pet peeve I could go on about that for a while but (laughs) But yeah, it's getting the, better. We're seeing more more improvement in that area from from certain broadcasts. Yeah, I have so many thoughts on what on everything you just said, but just <laughs> I have I'll go with three things. So one, I think Hayward has gotten better over time. I a think little, that a little bit, a little bit. It kind of makes sense what you're saying that with because Jim Fox is a bad man, but in the I think the best way possible for an analyst <laughs> because he just there's just nothing that he won't comment on um you know in terms of the <laughs> systems and what the how the players are playing which is good that's what you want and i think hayward has kind of allowed himself to either do more homework or just kind of be a little more unfiltered it's it's good there um but it is funny that you me- mentioned the big saves because as someone who used to play goalie i used to idolize the top 10 saves you know that used to be watching those top 10 saves in nhl.com was just that was I loved watching those because I thought that's you know that's what the great goalies do, right. and now that I've and now that it's been a few years or I mean going on many years I haven't played, I've realized a lot of the saves are just kind of lucky, right? I mean I not yeah. to bash goalies, but you know there's an open net, the guy happens to shoot it into his glove or hits you know shoots into the center of the net, and that manages to hit the goalie's pad. So it is funny that you mentioned that because yeah those saves are not really they're not bread and butter saves at all. Um, but speaking of pet peeves. This is a big pet peeve. And, you know, 17-year-old me would hate to hear this because I was a goalie who loved playing the puck. But I feel like nowadays, you know, what's your view on on goalies and their role playing the puck? Because it seems like with the game being so fast that it kind of does. I mean, you talked about Mike Smith and I mean, no (laughs) need to say much more there. So what's just kind of your view overall on on goalies playing the puck? Um, I think it can be done properly. Uh, okay. it's, it can be, it can be a benefit. Um, we saw it in St. Louis. They're a team that, especially when they had, uh, when they had Moose, when they had Brian Elliott there, um, that's a team that really used their goaltender as a part of their defensive breakout strategy. They didn't always let the goaltender, you know, fly out of their crease. They didn't go out to the face off dot, but they were the one who was expected to retrieve the puck from behind the net and then send it back up the boards. Um, And that's something that they worked on in practice. And then in contrast, the Coyotes are a team that does not do that anymore. (laughs) Rest in peace, Mike Smith. Um, You know, they, (laughs) when they brought Darcy Kemper and Auntie Ronson, and I've talked with both of them about it, that's the team strategy is goaltender does not go behind the net unless no one else is there. You know, you can go back there if you're trying to kill a little bit of if you're trying to, you know, speed the game up a little bit, you don't want to wait for your players to come all the way back and loop around. But if the play is in your end, the players are the ones who go behind the net to retrieve the puck. Um, and those are established systems for St. Louis versus Arizona. And I think both teams do a good job when they do play the puck because they know what they're supposed to be doing. Um, we see Corey Crawford's a guy who's an underrated puck player, in my opinion. Oh. Um, Henrik Lundqvist is not. Um <laughs> And so guys who have a clear set system, 
um, who have worked on it with their defenders, who know exactly what they're trying to do. I think that's okay. Um, because you're, you're essentially adding an extra guy out there who knows how to handle the puck properly. So you're getting, you know, you're getting three defenders in your own zone essentially, but then you have guys like Mike Smith who there is no rhyme or reason to when he plays the puck. Um, (laughs) there is no, there is no parameter set for how far he will go to play the puck. Um, and there's (laughs) no real, (laughs) there's no real concision between, where he plays the puck and he can do it really well. Um, I know that Kevin Woodley at Ingle Magazine actually gave us some of the data and the net positive for Mike Smith playing the puck in terms of controlled zone exits was higher than the number of goals he allowed. But that is a really low bar to me. But, w- um, but wouldn't, so- <laughs> wouldn't a goal be much worse one goal be much worse than 10 successful zone exits be good? I mean, anyway, sorry. I ha- would, this is a pet I peeve. Think so. when, they, when they broke it down, I mm-hmm. think that technically his his playing okay. the puck was a net gain. Um, okay. I do not we'll agree. I don't, I don't agree trust with the that. Numbers. Oh, I don't. I don't trust the numbers on that at all. I think, it's, uh, <laughs> I think that even if it looks like it's working, you have to consider – the confidence level it gives your teammates. And I am not super positive that Mike Smith's teammates are confident how can that he's going be? to play the puck the right way. Cause we've seen, right. We've seen him how many times in the last, in the last two years alone, go behind the net to play the puck, do it wrong or try and body a guy off the puck, which is not his job. <laughs> and then essentially allow an empty net. I know he did it on a, on Jerome McGinley's number retirement night in Calgary. He ruined that night for Calgary. fans. <laughs> um, I think they lost that game like four to one and at uh, least one or two of the goals, he was behind the net and it was wide open. So, so yeah, I think that's, it's a pet peeve of mine too, but I've been trying just from an, evaluation yeah. and analysis standpoint to be a little more open about it because I don't want to to unfairly minimize the impact that it can have for a guy like like Spencer Knight. He's he's a good puck player. He does it a lot, but he's smart about it. He's not he's not Mike Smith. So. Yeah, but come on, Mike Smith scored an empty net goal. He has to be a great <laughs> puck player, right? He also scored a goal with his butt, so I think there's a balance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That will go down That's it all. Yeah. All right. So the Ducks had a little bit of news in the last little bit that Lucas Dostal is officially coming over to America. And this is this kind of was exciting for a lot of different Ducks fans because he's kind of gotten a big shine to him over in playing in Liga, putting up some really good numbers last year, starting off this season uh, really, really well. But kind of looking at some scouting reports of him, even till now, the, the biggest knock on him is his size. And with him being six one, so first off, kind of, what are your thoughts on Lucas Dossel? What have I don't know if you really have been able to watch too much of him or do uh, enough of a scouting report on, but what are your thoughts on kind of Lucas Dossel to start with? I love him. I'm his number one fan. Hi. He's my oh, ride or that, die. That, that's um, great. I like that. I he's like my that. ride or die. Um, I, I I tweeted about him. I think it was about a month ago or so. I was doing a a top fifteen. NHL affiliated goaltending prospects. And so it was guys who are not, they, they all had to be called or eligible. So unfortunately, Igor Shesterkin ended up taking the number one spot because he technically still counted as a prospect. Um, okay. He's still called or eligible. Um, oh my God. Um, <laughs> Isabel, no bells. Thank you. You're no bells. Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> does anybody want a four year old? But yeah, um, <laughs> and I put I put Lucas Dostal somewhere right around the middle of the pack. He wasn't he wasn't in my top five. That spot okay. those spots unfortunately went to guys like a like Igor Shostak and Spencer Knight, um, Connor Ingram, who guys who are I think are essentially NHL ready. Um, they're just you know maybe half a season away from being there, if not already there for Shesterkin. Um, But I put, I put Dostal right in my like seven to 10 range. Um, I think he's smart. You see a lot of Czech goaltenders and I think we sort of fall into the the habit of stereotyping just based on national development. Uh, A lot of Czech born goaltenders play a little bit like Peter Mrazek, which is kind of stressful. Um, (laughs) 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 Kind of stressful. He's, he's chaos personified. Um, 
But Dostal really isn't. You know, he plays more of a controlled game. He's got the athleticism. He's got the agility, but he uses it. A, a little bit more conservatively, almost like almost like a John Gibson huh. type, where where you get that that agility, that flexibility. He can make some of those really acrobatic saves, but he doesn't do them unless he needs to, and he doesn't spend a whole lot of time outside of the blue paint unless he has to. Um, I also think he's super fun. He uh, a guy crashed his net during a game in Liga, and instead of letting the guy come back out, he stood up and kept moving. To keep the guy in the crease behind him until the until the whistle was blown. Um, so I did tweet a video of that a while back because that that cemented That's it that great. he's like he's my number one. But <laughs> no, I think he's I think he's great. Um, I think that anybody who's concerned about him being six foot one, uh, I think Jonathan Quick is six feet tall. Mark Andre Fleury is six one. Yeah. Tuka Rask is six one. Corey Crawford is six one. Maybe six two. Uh, Auntie Ronta is six feet tall, and I think that's being super optimistic for him. Um, <laughs> he might be under that. Anton Hadobin is 5'11. Yaroslav Halak is yeah. 5'11. You know, they're most gold. I think Carey Price is only 6'1 or 6'2. Outside of guys like, uh, I think Andre Vasilevsky is 6'1. Outside of the guys like Ben Bishop, uh, John Gibson's kind of a big boy. Um, mm -hmm. Thatcher Demko is a big boy. Jacob Markstrom, you know, they're big goaltenders but the majority of them are in that six one to six two range and if he's half an inch off on these these guys that are six two oh no yeah. um yeah size issues yeah exactly. so i think if he was if he was five foot nine i know i was watching a uh, dylan st cyr um for notre dame <laughs> last night that's a little kid i think he's probably my height um that's that's a concern that's the height where you have to kind of wonder if he's gonna thrive at the nhl level but a guy who's six one. I mean, that's that's yeah. the average height for goaltenders. Anyone who's worried about that is is getting worried about the wrong things for yeah. the moment. So that makes complete sense. Out of curiosity, where do you project Lucas Dostal to kind of end up if you you had to right now? Do you think he becomes an NHL six starter? A winner. A what? Six time Vesna winner. Ah, oh, perfect. I'm kidding. Ooh. I like I'm it. Kidding. I like I'm it. Kidding. I like it. I like no, it. It's sad now. No, it, 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 it's on this podcast. <laughs> Going with the Dutch fans. Here comes your six-time Vezina winner. No, I think I have him uh, for elite prospects. I know we're uh, we're doing our our player rankings and our grades right now, and I don't remember exactly what I have him as. Um, they they have a scale of one to nine. Nine is the best goaltender in the league, like a generational talent. The only guy who I have listed there right now is Yaroslav Askarov. Um, Spencer Knight is an eight. Um, Dominic Bass, who's a Chicago Blackhawks prospect who can't skate. Um, he's currently a 2.5. So <laughs> I think I have Dostal ranked at about a 7 or 7.5. Okay. So seems good. A quality NHL tandem or starter. I think he's he's very clearly going to establish himself in the NHL unless he takes a major step back when he hits North America, which I don't really see happening. Um, and then I, I have him as the team's projection, you know, where I realistically see the team using him. Um, I think he'd probably end up sitting sort of second fiddle to John Gibson, but potentially shifting into that starting role unless they bring in someone else that they value higher than him yep. in the next couple of years, which at the moment with no disrespect to Anthony Stolarz, who's <laughs> the nicest guy in the world. I love him to death. Uh, great interview. I don't think he's the goalie of their future. Um, <laughs> So I, I would assume that Dostal is who they currently have projected as their their heir apparent right there. Yeah, so. that, that makes sense. And I mean, we've talked about it a bunch. Stolarz at this point looks like he may be the NHL backup this season, pending how well, Ryan Miller plays out. As long as Ryan yeah. Miller doesn't come back. Yeah, yeah. and then Dostal yes. being the, the starter in the AHL probably is kind of where it looks like. It, yeah. it, it's probably going. Yeah, well, for a while it was supposed to be Ole Eriksson Ek. That was the heir apparent for the Ducks and that... He makes that me went, a little nervous. That he's, that 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 went how it went. <laughs> <laughs> so he's okay. He's but no, I think we've got more more of a structured game for for Lucas Dostal. I think he's a little bit more uh, a little bit more technically sound, and I think he reads the game a little bit faster. That's mm -hmm. with a lot of the, I think about half of the Czech prospects that it look like NHL projection guys. Um, about half of them play like Dostal, where they, they have more of a technical game with a really good read, and then the other half play like Peter Mrazek, where they have 
<laughs> more agility. They their reaction speed is elite. I, I'd put them in the top, you know, one percent in terms of reaction speed. But their game read is not where it should be. Um, and the the game structure in the Czech Republic is just a little different from North America. So they they read the game just a just a little, little bit different. Um, sometimes they have to play catch up on the plays, um, but that's not that's not something I've seen from Dostal. Okay, he rocks. Yeah, well, it is funny that Dostal has become this. I mean, this elite prospect because I remember just watching him in training camp last year, the year before. He always just stood out as this is how a goalie probably should be playing just in general, just sound not too crazy. And so it, it's nice to see that story unfold, but it is interesting because reading the Eric Stevens article at the athletic, the big profile and Dostal, how you had at least a couple of people, if not three people say, Oh yeah, worried about the size. And it's just, it's silly. It really is silly. But anyway, Jake, did you have anything else um, you wanted to hit? I think that's it from me. Okay. Well, I have a last one for you before we get out of here. Um, Gibson in shootouts and also sometimes in games, <laughs> but really in shootouts has tended to use the two pad stack poke check or the flying poke check. I want to describe it. Is that a good safe selection? <laughs> um, Oh, <laughs> I don't know. If good. I don't know. If good is the right word. Um, I, I grew up a big Johnny Bauer fan. Um, my oh, family's yeah. from Toronto. And so he, he knew my family. That's that's who I was wow. raised to believe is is a like the pinnacle of goaltending. And he sort of he sort of created that that two pad stack poke check. Um, so I'm biased. I think it's awesome, but I uh, I think you have to use it correctly. And I think maybe with the defensive structure that the Ducks have, it is not the best safe selection because once you make that poke check, like you're done. You might yeah. be able to like do the worm to get yourself at a slightly <laughs> different angle on the ice, but you're not, you're not getting back up to push back across the crease when you're, when you're in that position. So you really have to trust that the rest of the team is going to, uh, to bail you out. And I don't think that the ducks necessarily do, but no, as long as you're mixing it up in a, in the shootout and you don't, you don't sort of cheat and project that you're going to do it um, too often. Cause then, then guys are going to know you're, you're doing it and sort of dance around it. Uh, I think it's it's a great it's a great shootout move. Um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily use it in, in too many games. Yeah, I think there was a shootout where he did it twice. So, <laughs> and I think they asked him about it, or they asked the goalie coach about it, and they said that yeah, he's just he's just having fun out there, fighting off boredom. So, there you go. <laughs> it ma- it makes sense. It, it makes complete sense. Well, Kat, this was an absolute pleasure. Um, this was a lot of fun. Uh, just getting into goaltending i feel better for this so Agreed. before we head on out why don't you just let people know where they can find you what you're up to just uh, plug some stuff here yeah they can uh, they can find me on twitter at uh, i think it's at cat m silverman um and i i have a couple where we're doing our our team prospect profiles for for elite prospects right now i am not in charge of any particular team right now i'm just doing the goalies but uh so for each team, if they have a goalie ranked in their in their top prospects, uh, I'm doing the scouting reports on those. Um, I do have the the team yearbook for uh, for McKean's hockey is coming out in the next. I think it's in the next couple of days here, um, and so I'm sort of breaking down. We're about to see my child <laughs> <laughs> yes. making an appearance I'm at the end of the show. First four per- uh, <laughs> the first four person pod. Here we go. There she is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i'll be breaking down what each team's uh tandem looks like which i currently have just like a an anxious face emoji um for the ducks because i did my <laughs> yeah. my john Gibson one and then i don't know who's gonna be their number two um but yeah i i have those coming up and then a couple other things down the pipeline but but those are those are a little ways off so well, hey, thanks so much for having us. Maybe we'll do this again in the future once uh, Lucas Dostal has just uh, claimed his sixth Vezina trophy. We'll see. <laughs> or maybe just his first. Who knows? Uh, I guess we'll have plenty of opportunities there. But uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. If um, So I think we're going to put this in. We're going to, Jake, you said we're going to plug this into the episode, the recorded yeah. version. Yep. Okay. Yep. So I don't have to do all the plugs. All right. Well, hey, thanks so much for, having, or for coming on.
Thank Bye. you. Bye.